welcome to the hour of worship, the hour of blessing here on 3ABN. We are glad you have decided to join us and we encourage you to sing along and pray with us. We want to thank each and every one of you that prays for 3ABN. We need your prayers to keep going forward, preaching the gospel to all the world. During this hour, it's my pleasure to introduce my brother Tim Parton that will be leading you in singing praises to God and prayer. Thank you, Brother Tim. Amen. Thank you, Brother Johnny. Luke 12, verses 6 and 7. Jesus says, What is the price of five sparrows, two copper coins? Yet God does not forget a single one of them, and the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable than a whole flock of sparrows or a, uh, a flock of geese or a, a bunch of quail. <laughs> you are more important to God than those sparrows. And yet he's watching out for the sparrow. So whatever you have need of today, I encourage you to look to, look to God, to trust in him for your answer to be your source. I always like to sing this song to myself. Are you weary? Are you heavy hearted? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Are you grieving over joys departed? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. So Lord, we bring our needs to you. We trust that you care about each and every one of them. Father, those viewers who are watching that are facing situations that they know only you can, can do something about. Whether it be for a job, for some dependable transportation, for healing, physical healing, relational healing, healing in their marriage, they need healing in their family. God, we know that you are the one who hears and you care. Do you fear the gathering clouds of sorrow? Tell it to Jesus. Oh, tell it to Jesus. Are you anxious? What shall be tomorrow? Oh, please tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. So tell it to Jesus alone Father forgive us when we we want to talk about our problems we want to talk about our sad situations to each other Lord we know we are to tell each other and bear each other's burdens but God sometimes we just make it a just a time of gossiping about our own sad song in our sad state but Father you are the one I want to run to in all desperate times for all my desperate needs so Father I will tell you we bring to you our needs oh God are you troubled at the very thought of dying tell it to Jesus Tell it to Jesus, for Christ's coming kingdom, are you sighing? Oh, tell it to Jesus 
alone. Lord, we know that there are people on our, our prayer lists who we want to see give their heart to you. So I'm praying, God, that, Lord, you would work your way and your will. Father, you, alo- you declare that uh, you don't want anyone to perish. So I ask that you will um, stir our hearts to continue to pray for those souls that need to be won into your kingdom. And we thank you, Father, that you are victorious. We are victorious through you. Thank you for the victory that you gave us. And we claim that victory. And we will walk into that victory. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. And then once you've told it to him, only trust him. Only trust him. Only trust him now. And he will hear you. He will hear you. And he will save you. He will save you. He will save you now. You can depend on him. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Tim Parton. It's always a blessing to hear him play the piano and sing. And we encourage you to keep a song in your heart. Tell it to Jesus. He is waiting to hear from you. The title for today is Coronavirus, The Preventable Crisis. The question is, is it possible that this worldwide coronavirus, COVID-19, which threatens to kill millions of people around the world, the question is, are we facing a preventable crisis? We're going to go through a study of God's Word, and I would like to encourage you to join me along. Get your Bible ready, perhaps some paper to jot some things down. But before we do that, i like to go to the Lord in prayer once again and ask for His blessing, to ask Him to take over completely, that He may bless us according to our needs. Let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we come before You in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Lord, that we can worship you, trust in you, and tell you all of our concerns. In this moment, Lord, we ask for your blessing upon everyone that is listening, watching. We pray that your Holy Spirit will give us understanding of those things you want us to do and to learn. And we ask you, Father, to be with each and every one of your children. And Lord, I place myself in your hands. I ask for your Holy Spirit that every word may come from your throne of grace. And we ask you for these blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. When we consider the sufferings of this world, we must really ask ourselves, where is this suffering coming from? Some suffering comes to us because of our own making, our own decisions. Some sufferings comes to us because of being in contact with someone that may be sick. There are many different reasons, different factors that cause these things. But unfortunately, sometimes people blame God for things He has not done. And perhaps there are people blaming God for this coronavirus in which He really has had nothing to do with. I would like to invite you to join me in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. The Bible tells us, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now, understanding that God is love, we should 
be able to see and understand that he does not delight in seeing people suffer. So he will not cause suffering upon people unnecessarily. In John chapter 3, verse 16, and I will also read verse 17, notice what the Bible tells us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. This is the God, the creator, the one that loves us, the one that does not want to see us suffer in any way. But we must understand that we are living in a time when there's a great controversy between good and evil. The Bible talks about the enemy, the devil, as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But he works in different ways. And he uh, works very, very sneakily, if I could say it that way, and deceives people into saying things and doing things that causes them harm and causes other people harm. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 2, I'm sorry, first, uh, 3 John chapter 1, verse 2, the Bible tells us, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. This is the Apostle John writing to uh, God's church. But at the same time, we must understand that this is the same desire that God has for us. He wants us to prosper and be in good health. I would like to go to the book of Jeremiah and read for you a scripture that details what God has in mind for you. In Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, the Bible tells us, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. This is the marvelous God that created us, that loves us, that gave his only begotten son to die for us so that we can have eternal life. And he has thoughts of peace and thoughts of hope for you and for me. We are facing a great controversy between good and evil. And we must understand that God is not the author of mass suffering as some people have painted him. And so now uh, we are going to go to the book of Lamentation, chapter 3 and verse 33. In Lamentations chapter 3, verse 33, notice what the Bible says. For he does not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. So this is the way God is. And in the Bible are several examples of God exercising mercy, exercising love, extending uh, opportunity for people to repent before he punishes the people for the wickedness they do. Let's go to Genesis chapter 18, and I wish we had time to go through the whole thing, but we're going to have to skip some verses because we have a lot of things to share with you. In Genesis chapter 18, uh, Abraham and his wife are visited, and three the uh, three, pers three individuals come to see them, if I could say it that way, uh, three angels. But one of them is a divine being. In Genesis chapter 18, verse 20, now that they have had uh, time with uh, Abraham, then we pick up in verse 20. And the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, 
I will know. Then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. And Abraham came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous that were in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth do right. Abraham was acquainted with God and knew that God would not do such a thing. So he's asking him, are you going to slay the wicked with the righteous? It, it didn't seem like something God would do. So he's asking this question. Notice the answer of the Lord in Genesis chapter 18, verse 26. So the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. Notice here that God starts at 50. And we don't know how many people were in Sodom and Gomorrah. Perhaps there were thousands. But according to what God says here, what the Lord says, there is wickedness in Sodom and Gomorrah to such a degree that God must do something so that this doesn't spread to other nations. So God has to take action. But Abraham appeals to the Lord. Notice in 18, uh, Genesis 18, verses 27 through uh, 31. I'm sorry, we're just going to read uh, two more verses here. Genesis 18, verse 27 and uh, 28. Then Abraham answered and said, Indeed, now I who and but dust and ashes have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose there were five less than the 50 righteous. Would you destroy all the city for lack of five? So he said, if I find there 45, I will not destroy it. Praise the Lord that we have such a picture of the Lord that he starts at 50, but Abraham said, what, what, what if there are just five less than the 50? And the Lord said, if there are 45 good people, I will spare, spare them because there are 45 righteous people. What a marvelous God. This helps me to understand that today, societies, countries, cities benefit from the fact that there are good, righteous people in those cities. But notice, if you keep reading on, you will notice that Abraham continued to appeal to the Lord. Lord, what if, what if uh, there are 30? And then he went on to, he went to 20. And the Lord continued to say, I will not destroy it for the sake of the 20, of the 30, the 40, the 30, the 20. And you would think, wait a minute. With the mass multitude of people, God is going to spare all of this wickedness and put up with it because there are 20 good people there. God is so good. But now I want to take you to verse 32. When Abraham appeals to the Lord, took him, uh, if you want to say it that way, from 50 down to a number that is very low. Then he said, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak but once more. Suppose ten should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of ten. Praise God. Verse 33 says, So the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. Brothers and sisters, God is so good, so marvelous, that he helps us to understand that his mercy is beyond our understanding. He was willing to spare Sodom and Gomorrah if there were just 10 good, righteous people there. 
the wickedness was so, so large, so great, that God had to come down to take action before the wickedness, wickedness spreads to the rest of the countries, the rest of the people around them. But unfortunately, there were not, ten, not even 10 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah. And so the Lord had to take action to stop the evil from spreading. And Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. If you continue reading in Genesis, you will find that only four people left Sodom and Gomorrah before destruction came. And of the four, Abraham's wife, I'm sorry, Lot's wife, turned back and disobeyed what she was told and turned into a pillar of salt. So we have God letting us know that he is merciful. In fact, it is the devil that causes mass destruction and does so much uh, terror upon the world. Notice from the Great Controversy 589. In the Great Controversy 589, page 589, I'm going to read something that helps us understand this. Even now he is at work, talking about Satan, in accidents, in calamities by sea and by land, in great conflagrations. Those are fires. In fierce tornadoes and terrific hailstorms, in tempests, floods, cyclones, tidal waves, and earthquakes, in every place and in a thousand forms, Satan is exercising his power. He sweeps away the ripening harvest, and famine and distress follow. He imparts to the air a deadly taint, and thousands perish by the pestilence. These visitations are to become more and more frequent and disastrous. Destruction will be upon both man and beast. The earth mourneth and fadeth away. The haughty people do languish. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. This is uh, partially quoted from Isaiah 24, verses 4 and 5. So Satan is at work causing tornadoes and hailstorms, earthquakes, and people suffer, and then people blame God for these things. The history of Jacob helps us understand that Satan is the one that inflicts punishment. Read the story of Job, uh, I'm sorry, um, yes, of Job, and you will notice how Satan caused great suffering upon Job and his family. And I am going to read to you from the Desire of Ages 471. The history of Job has shown that suffering is inflicted by Satan and is overruled by God for purposes of mercy. But Israel did not understand the lesson. The same error for which God had reproved the friends of Job was repeated by the Jews in their rejection of Christ. You know, the Bible gives us examples of how the Lord acts and what process he takes, what steps he takes before destruction comes upon a city or a people. You can go through, uh, we can mention several examples, but easily you remember Noah, the Lord for 120 years through Noah and his family preached to the people that destruction was coming, that they should prepare themselves and get into the ark. Also, you, you can look at what we just talked about, Sodom and Gomorrah, they were warned before the things, uh, they were punished. Moses in Egypt warned the people of Egypt and also warned the people of Israel that if they don't obey, they would suffer because of their bad decisions. Jonah was sent to the people of Nineveh to repent before they had to suffer for their sins. So you see, the examples the Bible gives to us shows us that God warns people before he takes action, such as causing uh, punishment upon people. So the Bible has information for us so that we can make better decisions. Now let's go to the book of Matthew chapter 24 and verses uh, 3 to 8 really quick. We're going to read here. Because the disciples wanted to know about the end of the world and the destruction of Jerusalem. In Matthew 24, beginning in verse 3, 
Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Now, you may have heard this mentioned before. You've read it before. But please understand that the fact that this is mentioned as something that is going to happen in the future from the time of the disciples uh, unto the time of the end that we are living in does not mean that God is the one that is causing the earthquakes and the wars and the pestilences in various places. You well know that is you know, one nation gets upset with another nation and they cause war among each other. But Satan gets involved in these earthquakes and tornadoes and tempests and even pestilences such as we are facing now, the global pandemic, coronavirus, COVID-19. In the book of Isaiah, we have a message from the Lord that we should consider. And I am going to read to you from Isaiah chapter 26, uh, verse 20. And uh, then in a moment, I will read verse 21. Come, my people, enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself as it were for a little moment until the indignation is past. This gives me a picture of the situation that we are facing now. God wants us to hide as if for a moment, to protect ourselves from being infected by this virus that close contact with people brings upon us. So let us now read Isaiah 20, uh, 26, verse 21. For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also will disclose her blood and will no more cover her slain. The time will come when God will act to punish the inhabitants of this world for the iniquity and the evil that they are doing. But God warns his people, warns people before he takes action. The majority of the suffering that comes our way is because of our own decisions or intentional sin or rebellion. I can give you the example of somebody that decides, well, I've heard the information, uh, but I'm going to smoke anyway. And you see that the cigarette packs have the sign on them that this could cause problems for your health, even cancer. They are now putting these on cigarettes. But people go ahead and do this anyway. Will they blame God for inflicting the sickness that comes upon them from disobeying the laws of health? Some people do. There are also different things that people do. They put themselves in unnecessary danger. Uh, for me, it, I see it as an unnecessary risk to jump off a cliff, a bridge, or high structure with a bungee cord for merely enjoying myself. These are decisions that people make that causes suffering upon themselves. And many other things. There are even laws in the land about speed limits and things like that. Stop signs that people say, well, I'm just going to go through the stop signs whenever I please. And they can get into accidents. They can go through faster than the speed limit allows in the city whether it's 20 miles, 30 miles per hour, and they can go and run, drive over other people. So decisions, bad decisions, causes suffering. I want to point to you to Galatians chapter 6. In Galatians chapter 6, there is a principle there that we need to read to understand the way things are for us as human beings. 
This is a principle. The Bible tells us in verse 7, Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. And so the decisions we make will bring results. If you decide to plant grapes, you should expect to get grapes. Oranges, you should get oranges. If you decide to do good things, you should expect good things to happen. If you decide to do bad things, you should expect that bad things will happen to you or others. And if you do harm upon others, you will have to pay for these things because the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. But sin also causes suffering now while we are living because there are consequences for our bad decisions. I want to read to you from uh, Desire of Ages 824, a message that helps us understand these things. Christ had been the guide and teacher of ancient Israel, and he taught them that health is the reward of obedience to the laws of God. The great physician who healed the sick in Palestine has spoken, had spoken to his people from the pillar of cloud, telling them, what they must do, and what God would do for them. If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, he said, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Exodus 15 Verse 26, Christ gave to Israel definite instruction in regard to their habit, to their habits of life, and he assured them, the Lord will take away from thee all sickness. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 15. When they fulfilled the conditions, the promise was verified to them. And this is why you find in Psalm 105, verse 37, the following words. There was not one feeble person among their tribes. Praise be to God. I want to encourage you to follow the principles of health found in the Bible. And we're going to read some of them given time. You may recall from the story in the Gospels, Something that Jesus said, Jesus said several people uh, that Jesus healed, he told them something specific because uh, diseases, a lot of diseases is the result of violating God's laws. So some of the people that Jesus healed, he specifically told them, go and sin no more lest a worse thing come upon you. So I encourage you to follow God's principles that you may enjoy good results because remember, be not deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. Now the coronavirus, COVID-19, is one of the greatest threats that is, uh, humanity is facing right now. And there's great fear among the people. So we have to ask ourselves questions. Where did this come from? Now, doing some research, and I have to praise the Lord because uh, my wife, Idalia, I was praying and asking the Lord, Lord, where, what is, where did this thing come from? Why is it that we have this horrific uh, pandemic going on, killing hundreds and thousands of people? And I was praying and praying shortly thereafter, my wife, Idalia, put on a video, and I started to listen. And I said, this is logical. This makes sense. And it led me on to do further research. And I want to read to you, I mean, uh, yes, read to you from a YouTube video where a Dr. Michael Greger, Director of Public Health and Animal Agriculture in the Humane Society, he shared a, a, uh, a lot of interesting information. You can easily find this video because this is Pandemics, History, and Prevention. Pandemics, History, and Prevention. Now, he did so much research. There are about 22 pages of references of articles and books that he looked into before he prepared his presentation. So, the question that I asked, where did this come from? 
is censored in that video by another doctor because Jim Lehrer from the News Hour with Jim Lehrer, he says, well, the senior correspondent of News Hour with Jim Lehrer posed that question to Dr. Webster. Who's Dr. Webster? The so-called godfather of flu research. Was there something qualitatively different about this last day, decade made it po that made it possible for this disease to do something it's never done before? Some kind of changing conditions that suddenly, suddenly lit a match to the tinder. Webster replied to Jim Lehrer, he said, farming practices have changed. He talks about growing up on a farm, and then he says, but now we put millions of chickens into a chicken factory, next door to a pig factory, and this virus has the opportunity to get in one of these chicken factories and make billions and billions of these mutations continuously. And so what we've changed is the way we raise animals and our interaction with those animals. And then he talks about how the virus is escaping from the factories, infecting even the wild birds. He says, that's what's changed. We've changed the way we raise animals. But as we change the way we raise the animals, we raise animals now by the billions. And the conditions these animals live in uh, there are pictures you can find on the internet. You can easily uh, look under industrialized farms and you will find uh, pictures of chickens living in conditions inside hundreds and thousands upon thousands of chickens. There are stories, or not stories, but uh, information that in China there is one uh, such uh, industrialized farm or, or uh, uh, these farms where the animals are kept, that has about a million chickens. And they have many of these farms in China. We have some of these industrialized farms here in the US uh, where they have cows, where they have pigs, hundreds and hundreds side by side in cramped spaces. And this creates an atmosphere for disease to grow and viruses to mutate, go from one to another. Also, there are places in the world that still sell live animals. And people go there and buy their animals while they're alive. This is also a dangerous situation because this is how diseases have spread. And actually, there are so-called wet farms. And it's understood, the research I've done, indicates that these were the conditions upon which the coronavirus COVID-19 surfaced. There are markets in Wuhan where, where people have uh, all kinds of different animals, live animals, and people go to these places and buy them. And uh, dangerous, dangerous conditions. Let's continue. Another video, actually this is a, an article uh, found on the internet from the magazine The Atlantic. And this time it's a Dr. Robert Lawrence Professor of Environmental Health Sciences, Health Policy and International Health at the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And he says, our current model of food animal production factors heavily into viral evolution and transmission. The system, which is vastly different than it was just a century ago, provides some efficiency, but it poses grave threats to public health, including increased risk of pandemic influenza. Beginning in the 1940s, he says, and intensifying recently, small farms were replaced by large industrial operations that confine thousands or even millions of animals at a single site. The animals are raised in cramped charters, in constant contact with their waste, and fed corn and soybeans in place of the forage for which their digestive systems evolved. He believes in evolution. That's why he uses these words. Additionally, he says, the stress is induced by confinement and constant respiratory exposure to high concentrations of ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, and other gases from concentrated 
waste leaves animals more susceptible to viral infections. These conditions allow viruses to infect again and again, increasing the frequency of mutations and viral reassortment, the raw material for evolution. In other words, he is saying the conditions that we are raising these animals is a condition upon which disease can spread and be passed on to uh, human beings. In the LA Times article, January 26, 2020, a, uh, Wendy Orent, who is the author of a book, uh, Plague, the Mysterious Past and Terrifying Future of the World's Most Dangerous Disease, she says coronaviruses have proven themselves masters at jumping from one species to another and how they affect each species can differ greatly. An infection hardly noticeable in a wild animal. Perhaps a civet cat may spread easily to the next cage where that cage houses more civets or another mammalian species. With coronaviruses, the jump from species to species appears to happen fairly easily. And so, she also states the massive poultry farms of Asia, which may house as many as 5 million chickens, present a different but also potentially lethal source of human infection. There, viruses such as influenza become highly adapted in crowded cir circumstances, even more deadly to chickens, and there is no cost to the virus if it's lethal, the next host is only a beak away. So caging these different wild beasts together by the hundreds and thousands is creating as atmosphere for infectious disease. I must hurry. I see the time is going quickly. Let's go quickly to Leviticus chapter 11. In Leviticus chapter 11, I'm going to read quickly verses 1 through 5. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, These are the animals which you may eat among all the animals that are on the earth. These, uh, among them, verse 3, Among the animals, whatever divides the hoof, having cloven hooves and chewing the cud, that you may eat. This includes the cow. Nevertheless, these you shall not eat among those that chew the cud or those that have cloven hooves. The camel, not supposed to eat camels because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves. Hooves, It is unclean to you. The rock hyrax, which is also called the coney uh, in the King James Version, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. So this rock hyrax is also called a cape hyrax, a rock rabbit, and a coney. Now these are conditions, or these are things that God is telling us how to avoid diseases. These animals were animals that are animals that clean up after the rubbish and garbage that are left behind by the forest, by other animals. They even eat dying and decaying animals. Notice Leviticus 11 verse 6. The hair, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. Leviticus chapter 11, verse 7 and 8, notice. And the swine, though it divides the hoof, having cloven hooves, yet does not chew the cud, is unclean to you. Their flesh you shall not eat, and their carcasses you shall not touch. They are unclean to you. What are we talking about here? We're talking about pork. You may call it pork, swine, whatever it is you call it. These animals are like a factory house of infectious things to grow. Uh, you may have heard of uh, the warm trichina that has killed a lot of people. I met a man recently that, uh, in Dominican Republic where he told me, I nearly died. I was eating pork and I didn't know better and I was eating, I used to eat this a lot and it nearly killed me. He told me he was uh, for a long time in the hospital, was even in a coma. And he says, thanks to God, I am alive today to warn other people to leave this thing. Well, you may say, I've been eating pork for years and nothing has happened to me. Be thankful to God. But the scriptures say that this is an animal that is unclean, an animal that is dangerous to eat. I encourage you to leave that and follow what God says to avoid diseases. Notice what Isaiah chapter 66, verse 17 
tells us, those who sanctify themselves and pure the, purify themselves to go to the gardens after an idol in the midst, eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse, they shall be consumed together, says the Lord. So this animal, swine and mouse, are not fit food for God's people. If you want to avoid diseases, you can go to Leviticus 11, learn a lot of information, guidelines for you to follow if you want to live a healthy life. You may remember, now that I mentioned swine, that there was a swine flu in 2009. And this swine flu, uh, it was a pandemic that sprang out of one of the massive farms in Veracruz, Mexico, where hundreds of pigs died in an outbreak that eventually moved into people. This caused an influenza virus and infected at least 1.6 million people and killed at least 19,000 worldwide. In 1967, there was a Hong Kong flu that killed at least 1 million people around the globe. You also may have heard recently about the infamous uh, uh, 1917, 1918 influenza that claimed about 50 million people. The conditions that animals are being raised today, it's a dangerous condition. And we need to make wise decisions to avoid sickness. Leviticus chapter 11, verses 9 through 12. We're not going to be able to read all of Leviticus 11 because of lack of time. But I will read quickly to you here. These you may eat all that are in the water. Whatever in the water has fins and scales, whether in the seas or in the rivers, that you may eat. Good news. But in all these seas or in the rivers that do not have, but all in the seas or in the rivers that do not have fins and scales, all that move in the water or any living thing that which is in the water, they are an abomination to you. They shall be an abomination to you. You shall not eat their flesh, but you shall regard their carcasses as an abomination. So brothers and sisters, we need to avoid these things. They are dangerous, bad for your health. And uh, this that I just read includes shrimp, lobster, these animals that clean in the ocean. They are dangerous for your health. Leave them to avoid sickness is my appeal to you, this is what the Bible tells us. This new virus, the early information that I heard about the virus in, uh, in Wuhan, China, where this coronavirus, they say it originated there. First information I heard, it was somebody eating bat soup that was contaminated that brought this about. I also heard that perhaps it was snake. Whichever one of these it was, it was in this market. They know it was in the market that, uh, such as described, these wet markets where there are different types of animals, filthy conditions, crowded, and uh, this is a dangerous thing. So we, as a people in the world, need to make changes. I want to uh, say uh, something interesting to you because... Uh, Looking in YouTube, found a video by uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci. And in 2017, speaking before a group of people, analyzing data from other diseases and history and conditions in the world, he said there could be in the future a pandemic outbreak of influenza. We are facing that. Is he a prophet? No. But he examines data scientifically. The conditions are there for diseases to spread, and he was just stating a possibility of something happening in the future, and we are facing today. Coronavirus, COVID-19, is a type of influenza. Remember, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. So what do we do? How do we stop this thing from surfacing again? Well, Robert Webster, that I quoted earlier, a leading flu scientist concluded a landmark article on the emergence of pandemic viruses. This is several years ago. He said these words in that article. An immediate practical approach is to close all live poultry markets. He goes on to note that with refrigeration systems widely available, 
it is no longer necessary to sell live birds. The reality is that traditions change very slowly, but a new pandemic could accelerate this process. In other words, they should take the warnings of the pandemics that have already killed thousands of people and say, we need to make changes here. And there are these types of markets in different countries. I want to read to you from Testimonies, chapter, uh, Testimonies, volume 7, page 124. Ellen G. White making a statement. Notice these words. Animals are becoming more and more diseased, and it will not be long until animal food will be discarded by many besides Seventh-day Adventists. Wow, this is an incredible statement. This was made in 1902, and it is true today. Many people are realizing that a lot of the food, a lot of the meats are not good to eat. And others besides Seventh-day Adventists are abandoning meat because they understand that there is a better way. And if you look in the Bible, you will notice that the original diets that God gave to people did not include meat. And if animals are becoming more and more diseased, in 1902 this statement was made, what should you do? We are living in the last days, and I encourage you to make wise decisions. 3ABN has wonderful uh, cooking programs showing you how to make healthy recipes, vegan, vegetarian recipes without animal products so that you may enjoy better health. I encourage you to watch 3ABN, see these programs, and learn how to cook food that is uh, good for you. Um, now, if you want to increase your probability of survival, if you are infected with the coronavirus or whatever disease you may have, I would like to read to you from uh, the Ministry of Healing, page 295, 295, also found in Councils on Diets, page 81. These are the words. Grains, fruits, nuts, and vegetables constitute the diet chosen for us by our Creator. I'll say that again. Grains, fruits, nuts, and vegetables constitute the diet chosen for us by our Creator. These foods, prepared in as simple and natural a manner as possible, are the most healthful and nourishing. They impart a strength, a power of endurance, and a vigor of intellect that are not afforded by a more complex and stimulating diet. So, brothers and sisters, I appeal to you, Make good decisions for your health. God is coming for a people, and uh, we have a wake-up call for us in this pandemic to get our lives in order and to follow the Lord with all of our heart. I encourage you, consider these things that you may enjoy better health. God loves us wants the best for us. And I want to read to you from Daniel chapter 4, verse 27. This is a principle. This is Daniel talking to King Nebuchadnezzar after sharing with him something about the way he was living. In Daniel 4, verse 27, he says, Therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. So if you see that you have been making uh, error in the way you have been eating, it is time to make changes. And I understand that uh, there are companies messing around with the food and they are being genetically modif modified and some grains have been affected that I would say it's better not to eat those grains. Look for grains that are not genetically modified to have the best chances of health. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, we have a message from the Lord, for the Lord for us. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, I'm going to start reading in verse 11. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and king's house. And Solomon successfully accomplished all that came into his heart to make in the house of the Lord and in his own house. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, 
I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain or command the locust to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Praise God. Even if because of our sins, God sends locusts, God sends a pestilence, He is willing to forgive us. He is willing to heal us if we humble ourselves, repent, ask Him for forgiveness. If we appeal to God in this way, He will have mercy upon us. Psalms 103, verses 1 through 8, the Bible tells us, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known His ways to Moses, His acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. Praise be to God. The Lord is merciful and kind to each and every one of us. He's been merciful and kind to you. You have opportunity to search the scriptures, to read and get yourself ready. Let us pray for all of the people affected by the coronavirus. Let us pray for all of these medical personnel that are helping hundreds and thousands of people. Let us humble ourselves before the Lord that we may receive His blessing. God bless you.